The films on this video show scenes of the city of Newcastle upon Tyne, regional capital of North East England, at various dates between 1928 and 1973. They concentrate on the life and work of the people of Newcastle and on the many physical changes to the appearance of the city over almost 50 years. The video has been produced with the assistance of the Tyne and Weir Archive Service and the film footage which follows has been taken from its splendid collection. The first selection is from a series of amateur films shot between 1928 and 1938, beginning with winter scenes on the Great North Road in Jesmond and at the top of Benton Bank. Jesmond, northeast of the city centre between the Great North Road and the Ouseburn, was incorporated into Newcastle in 1835 and developed quickly between the 1890s and the First World War as select terraced housing was added to the villas and mansions of the gentry. Icy roads were treacherous for horses. Here, a tractor assists with coal deliveries. A service 38 tram on Osborne Road. These scenes of the Sandhill and the Quayside Sunday Market can be dated to May 1928, when the new Tyne Bridge was nearing completion. Although a medieval origin is sometimes claimed for it, the Sunday market seems to have been fully established only after the rebuilding of the Quay Wall, after 1865. It was the haunt of mock auctioneers, quack doctors and racing tipsters, anything likely to relieve the public of its money. Although a relatively prosperous city compared with some of its neighbours, between the wars, many thousands of Newcastle people lived a life of grinding poverty. Also near the quayside was the Saturday Paddy's Market, where old clothes and discarded household goods were laid out on the cobbled streets for sale. The Scotswood Road Bridge, west of the city, was opened in 1831 and was demolished, to much regret, in 1962. Upriver from it is the Scotswood Railway Bridge, until 1928, Newcastle and its southern neighbour Gateshead were linked by four bridges. The low-level swing bridge, which was opened in 1876 on the site of the Roman Bridge, and its successors, the high-level bridge, built to the designs of Robert Stevenson for road and rail and opened in 1850, the King Edward Bridge of 1906 for rail only, and upstream the Redhuff Bridge, first opened in 1871 and rebuilt in 1901. On the 10th of October 1928, these were joined by the Tyne Bridge, now the universally recognised symbol of the city, when it was officially opened by King George V. Jesmond Dean, a one and a half mile stretch of the Ouseburn, was created for the armaments manufacturer William, later Lord Armstrong, as a private park. The burn itself was romanticised by the construction of bridges and waterfalls. Held on part of the city's ancient town moor, the Northeast Coast Exhibition of 1929 was designed to show off the region's industries to the nation and the world. It was inspired by the British Empire Exhibition at Wembley in 1924. Planned in 1926, the costs were subscribed by local authorities businesses and many individuals. The futuristic temporary buildings of the Palace of Engineering and the Palace of Industry were made of asbestos sheeting on a steel framework and were completed within a year. Because of the value of its contents, the Palace of Arts, approached by a bridge across the boating lake, was more strongly built was subsequently used as an industrial museum and still survives as the military vehicle museum. The main buildings of the exhibition, apart from the two palaces, were the festival hall used for concerts, 
a 20,000-seater stadium for sports events, gymnastic displays and sheepdog trials, and an Empire Marketing Board pavilion. The exhibition was opened by the Prince of Wales on the 14th of May 1929. More than four million people visited the exhibition between then and its closing on the 26th of October 1929. This was more than 15 times the population of Newcastle. By the time the Northeast Coast exhibition closed, the trade depression had hit the Northeast with full force. Although it was claimed that several orders for local industry had been received as a result of the displays, the chief virtue of the exhibition was that it had provided education, amusement and excitement for millions in a difficult period of the city's history. It even made a modest profit of almost £7,000. There was an African village where over a hundred Senegalese lived their daily lives in mud huts. As well as the more formal buildings, there was a fairground with a water chute, the mile-long Himalayan railway and a menagerie of depressed-looking animals. After the exhibition closed, most of the structures were demolished and sold. For example, the roof trusses of the palaces of industry and engineering went to Prestwick Airport to be used in new aircraft hangars. On the 9th of May, 1937, as part of the coronation celebrations, Jewish ex-servicemen marched through the city to the war memorial in Eldon Square. The streets, particularly Blackett Street, still display their decorations. The Jewish community in Newcastle had expanded rapidly in the second half of the 19th century, particularly in the clothing and jewellery trades. By 1914, there were two synagogues in the city, in Lees's Lane and Jesmond. The parade was inspected by the Lord Mayor, who's seen here with his sword-bearer and mace-bearer. Only two years later, preparations were being made throughout the city for the approaching Second World War. Air raid shelters were hastily built and trenches dug in the parks. Many householders had received their Anderson shelters, buried them in their gardens and planted vegetables and flowers on them. Soon the city's school children would be evacuated to the rural areas of Northumberland and Cumberland. The life of every individual was affected in some way. Here, men of the 1st Northern Casualty Clearing Station, Royal Army Medical Corps, change from civilians into soldiers. These scenes of student life at King's College, now Newcastle University, were shot in 1953 and include panoramic views of the city. King's College was constituted in 1937 as the Newcastle Division of the University of Durham. It was an amalgamation of Armstrong College, founded in 1871, and the College of Medicine, established in 1832. To this nucleus, a school of art was added in 1911 and a school of agriculture in 1914. The college and its constituent parts had occupied buildings all over the city, but in 1888, a site was bought at Barris Bridge, where all significant subsequent expansion has taken place. A new medical school was opened in February 1939. The Students' Union was built in 1924 to provide social and recreational facilities for the growing student body, which had increased from just over 1,000 in 1922 to over 3,000 in 1950. Since the end of the war, the college had been steadily acquiring property in the Haymarket, St. Thomas's Street, Queen Victoria Road, and on both sides of Claremont Road for expansion. By the date of this film, new buildings for chemistry and mechanical engineering had been opened 
and many more were soon to follow. Some of the largest crowds ever seen in the city centre assembled for the royal visit by Her Majesty the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh on the 29th of October 1954. This was the first visit by a reigning monarch to Newcastle since a rather low-key visit on the 7th of April 1943 by King George VI and Queen Elizabeth. A trolleybus inspection tower provided a good vantage point for a lucky corporation transport staff. The crush of people in the city centre was described by the police as the greatest ever seen. Although at this time, huge crowds were becoming quite common, following Newcastle United's recent successes in the FA Cup. The coronation had taken place just over a year earlier, in June 1953, and this was the first chance Novocastrians had had to see their new queen at close quarters. So many people were waiting at the Jesmond Road Great North Road Junction and on Barris Bridge that additional crush barriers were hastily erected. The royal visit to Tyneside had begun early in the morning with Her Majesty's arrival in the royal train at Monk's Eaton and had included the inspection of a parade at Tynemouth. It was to end for Newcastle at 2.30 in the afternoon when the royal party crossed the Tyne Bridge into Gateshead. Earlier royal visits to the city had, as we'll hear, a specific purpose, usually the opening of some large public building. The 1954 visit to Newcastle was one of a series made by Her Majesty, subsequent to her coronation, to major centres of population throughout the country in order to familiarise herself with its places and people. To this end, official engagements were deliberately kept to a minimum and the emphasis was laid on motorcades, which gave as many people as possible an opportunity to see the royal couple. The walkabout was many years in the future. At Blackett Street Post Office, office workers crane out of windows hours before the procession was due to arrive. Meanwhile, in the grounds of the Royal Grammar School, the 272 Northumbrian Regiment Royal Artillery prepares for a 21-gun salute. Some eager ladies seek a precarious perch as more crowds wait outside the mansion house in Fernwood Road, Jesmond, the Lord Mayor's official residence, where they were entertained by the massed bands of the 1st and 4th 5th Battalions of the Royal Northumberland Fusiliers, TA. The Queen arrives at the Mansion House, where she inspects the Guard of Honour of three officers and a hundred men of the 4th 5th Battalion of the Royal Northumberland Fusiliers, commanded by Captain J. W. Wilson. The Queen next entered the Mansion House for luncheon with the Lord Mayor, Alderman Colonel R. Mould Graham, while the crowd waited patiently. Before luncheon, and unfilmed, members of the City Council and other prominent citizens were presented. After lunch, further presentations were made in a marquee in the Mansion House grounds.
the Royal Party left for the city centre via Osborne Road, Chesman Dean Road and the Great North Road, the last of which was lined with school parties. Over the previous 70 years, there had been several significant royal visits to Newcastle. In 1884, the Prince of Wales had opened the Hancock Museum, the Reference Library in New Bridge Street, and Jesmond Dean as a public park. In July 1906, he returned as King Edward VII to open the Royal Victoria Infirmary, the main block of Armstrong College, and the railway bridge across the Tyne, which bears his name. George V opened the new Tyne Bridge and visited Heaton Secondary School in October 1928. Just before the war, on the 21st of February 1939, King George VI opened the new medical school in Queen Victoria Road. The royal route through the city centre was by Barris Bridge, Northumberland Street, Blackett Street, Gray Street and Moseley Street. The day's excitement over, the crowds disperse and the trolley buses resume their interrupted journeys. A River Speaks was made for the Northeast Industrial and Development Association and was released in February 1957. Its opening scenes are a reminder of just how much the coal industry had contributed to Newcastle's prosperity since the late Middle Ages. Although very little coal had actually been mined within the city boundaries, much of the product of the northeast coal field had been traditionally traded through Newcastle and shipped from its river. Profits from the coal trade had helped to build the many magnificent streets and buildings of which Newcastle can boast. Although by the 1950s employment in coal mining was declining, there were still many colliery villages on the outskirts of Newcastle. Coal miners lived in what had once been almost closed communities. Although this was changing, miners were still bound together by the danger of their work, their trade unions and social clubs, and their shared leisure pursuits, of which the breeding and racing of pigeons was one. No colliery community was without its rows of crees. The 1950s was the last decade of the slow and gradual evolution of Newcastle. 
At this time, the roads and streets were much as they had been laid out in the 19th century and earlier. On them, the electric-powered trolley bus was still the prime mover of people about the city. But it was already being challenged by the motor bus and was to disappear altogether by 1966. The growth in personal motoring and the unrestricted access to the city centre was, as elsewhere, beginning to cause problems. The solutions which were to be employed in the 1960s and 1970s were to transform the appearance of much of the city, for good or ill. At the foot of Castle Stairs was Sandhill and the Quayside. And once again, the camera has been attracted by the Sunday market. These images can be compared with those of 1928, shown earlier. The market was described rather fancifully in 1954 as resembling the bazaars of the East. It opened at 11 a.m. and closed by law at 2.30 p.m. So approximately a hundred stall holders and barrow boys had only three and a half hours to make as much profit as they could. In the 1950s, sea-going ships were still often tied up at the quay while the market was in progress and loomed over the proceedings. No fee was paid or license required to take part in the market and there were no reserved stands although the longest established traders were allowed by consent to occupy their customary pitch. The quack doctors and racing tipsters had survived into the 1950s and still attracted the largest crowds. But the stalls were now much more varied, selling blankets, nylons and other fabrics, footwear and second-hand books. The goods on offer were reasonable rather than cheap, and real bargains were rare. The volume of noise was considerable as thousands milled about the stands, bargaining and exchanging friendly banter with the hucksters. All of Newcastle's old street markets vanished in the 19th century. Some, such as the iron and wool markets, which were held near St. Nicholas Church, have left no record. Others are remembered because of surviving street names. The cloth market, hay market, the groat or meal market, and the big, or barley market. A pan across the city's three central bridges, the High Level, the Swing Bridge and the Tyne Bridge begins a trip down river. Past Spillers Mill to the location of the shipbuilding industry at Walker and Walls End. The Tyne was one of the world's great shipbuilding rivers and this along with the coal trade and heavy engineering, had traditionally been one of the foundations of the city's prosperity. Ships had been built on the river since medieval times. In 1294, a galley was completed at Newcastle for King Edward I. But it was the introduction of iron hulls and steam power in around the middle of the 19th century which led to massive expansion. Shipbuilding yards sprang up on both banks of the Tyne, from Newcastle to the sea. The industry faltered between the wars, then was stimulated by warship construction, but the 1950s and 1960s were the last decades of any degree of success, as overseas builders steadily cut into what had once almost been a British monopoly. In 1901, British yards had supplied 55% of world shipping, in 1960, the figure was down to 15%, and the decline of Tyne shipbuilding was proportional. 
A typical, though unglamorous, product of Tyne Yards was the Katsina Palm, launched from swan hunter Wiggum Richardson's Neptune Yard at Low Walker on the 26th of August 1957. The 11,200 ton vessel was designed for trade with West Africa and was built for the Palm Line. Old and new shipbuilding techniques were used in the construction of the ship. Welding was replacing riveting, many sections were prefabricated and the superstructure was of aluminium alloy. In 1860, John Wiggum Richardson bought the former Coots shipyard at Low Walker, from which had been launched in 1842, the first iron ship built on the Tyne. At this date, only about 200 men were employed at what was a very modest-sized facility, renamed the Neptune Yard. Expansion was gradual, the Neptune engine works being established in 1872 and the North Yard in 1898. Next to these yards, to the east along the Tyne, was the Wall's End Yard founded in 1873 by Charles Mitchell and managed from 1874 until his accidental death in 1879 by Charles Sheraton Swan under the name of C.S. Swan and Company. After Swan's death, he fell from a channel paddle steamer and was killed by one of the paddles, George B. Hunter became manager of the company, which was renamed C.S. Swan and Hunter in 1880. Swan Hunter Wiggum Richardson was formed in 1903 from the amalgamation of these existing companies to bid for a Cunard order for a massive passenger liner. The order was won, and the ship was launched in 1906 as Mauritania, sister ship of the ill-fated Lusitania. At the same time as the two companies amalgamated, they took over the adjacent premises of the Tyne Pontoons and Dry Dock Company, and shortly afterwards bought a controlling interest in the Walls End Slipway and Engineering Company. Swan Hunters now had a long river frontage with 17 building slips, four of which were covered with glass roofs for all weather work. Mauritania was only one of 11 vessels completed in 1907. In that year, the company's output was 15% of the total tonnage built in the world. Between 1906 and 1912, the firm held the world record for gross tonnage of shipping constructed. Their yards have built tankers, cargo ships like Katsina Palm, cable ships, ferries and dry docks. For the Navy, cruisers, destroyers, submarines and aircraft carriers were produced. In their long history, the yards completed over 1,600 ships. A roll call of names would include, in addition to the Mauritania, the battleship HMS Anson, the cruiser HMS Edinburgh, the aircraft carriers HMS Ark Royal and Illustrious, which was completed at high speed for service in the Falklands War the passenger liners Dominion Monarch and Vista Fjord. Of eight supertankers built between 1968 and 1976, the best known on Tyneside was Esso Northumbria. Enormous crowds lined the banks of the Tyne to see her leave the river. This long and proud history of achievement came to an end in 1994 when the company, which had become a specialist warship builder dependent on government orders, failed to win a tender, went into receivership and did not find a buyer. It's tragically unlikely that the spectacle of a launch like this will ever be seen on the Tyne again. The 1960s was a decade during which the appearance of Newcastle began to change radically. Although the city's first development plan was published in 1951 and approved in 1953, it wasn't until late in the decade that the charismatic council leader T. Dan Smith, with city planning officer Wilfred Burns, began to push ahead with the full development of Newcastle as a regional capital, including a motorway system linked to the city centre, and the redevelopment of that city centre, with new shops and offices mainly in the Northumberland Street, Percy Street and Blackett Street Triangle. <laughs> 
also proposed were new higher education facilities grouped together in an education precinct and new housing for the city's people. Much of what was planned in about 1960 has come to pass and these films show various aspects of this grand design. The cramped Central Library, opened in 1884 in New Bridge Street, was replaced by a new building in 1968. East of the city, the coast road between Chillingham Road and Will's Tobacco Factory was upgraded. In the Sandyford area, mid-19th century terraced housing, once very select, was cleared for the building of the proposed education precinct, later Newcastle Polytechnic, and now the University of Northumbria. However, although part of the College of Arts and Technology, now Newcastle College, was built on this site, for various reasons, particularly the rapid growth of the Polytechnic, the greater part of it was built on a new site over a mile away at Rye Hill. In the Grote Market, new offices and works for the Evening Chronicle and the Journal were completed in 1965. The Old Town Hall is in the background. Housing in the Blandford Street area was cleared. Phoenix expanded into Brunswick Place. In 1958, it was calculated that of 88,000 houses in the city, 10,000 would have to be cleared, and a further 15,000 needed minor improvements pending clearance. This was a drastic state of affairs, and speed was essential. The problems created by the necessity to rehouse so many people, combined with the shortage of land, appeared to have been solved by the use of system-built tower blocks, which were relatively cheap and could be erected quickly. By late 1960, 19 tower blocks were under construction throughout the city, and by 1968, 42 blocks were occupied. <laughs> 
These examples were built at Shieldfield, just east of the city centre, in 1963. It wasn't until years later that the social and other problems inherent in this type of housing began to appear. They were disliked by many older people and by families with young children. Although the council had built some low-rise housing along with the tower blocks, by the 1970s the latter were falling out of favour and more emphasis was being placed on varied and community-orientated housing, such as that at Biker. But by the end of the 1960s, most of the crumbling 19th century flats had gone. The 1960s had been a decade of immense change in the fabric of the city, which at this time was described as a potential Brasilia of the North. The skyline was a forest of tower cranes, as new housing replaced old, new roads cut through the city, and new office buildings sprang up in its centre. This film, made in about 1970 for the council, is essentially a promotional effort for the city, and shows some of the changes which had taken place over the previous decade. The concrete and glass slab of Swan House, opened in May 1970, is rather unkindly bracketed between shots of the medieval cathedral, keep and black gate, and the classical splendour of the Granger development of the 1830s. The superb Theatre Royal. Exchange buildings and Gray's Monument. King's College, which had become the University of Newcastle in 1963, expanded at speed along both sides of Claremont Road. The Civic Centre, with its circular council chamber and external sculptures, was begun in 1960 and opened in 1968. It was a symbol of the new city and an expression of its revitalised local government. Six to Midnight was produced by the Amber Films Cooperative for the City Council in 1973. The film is an impressionistic account of a day in the life of the city and its people using natural sound. Thin crowd about at times, but uh, some sunny spells during the day everywhere. 
The indoor Granger Market, opened in 1835, is still providing a service to the city. Just a minute, love. Give us a book, Martin, will you? Oh, yes, just lend us a book. Just put it on. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Doherty. Mrs. Um, Hamilton, three pence. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, I'll come on now. I'll come on now. The large open hall is the vegetable market. Spiller's Flour Mill on the East Quayside. The Central Arcade, with its superb faience tiling, was opened in 1906, after a fire had gutted most of Exchange buildings. They had once contained an art gallery and a small concert hall. Northumberland Street, the city's main shopping street since the 1880s. from Gray's Monument. The street facades of many of the major buildings in the city centre had recently been cleaned. Highbridge and the Big Market, then as now the focus of the city's nightlife. We hope that you've enjoyed this selection of films on Newcastle-upon-Tyne and that they've brought back some memories of the city as it used to be.